Let's assume we are live. Uh, right, good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth of my virtual Jericho, or maybe it's the fifth. Each Wednesday afternoon at five o'clock, you can tune in if, in if you're in Jericho, if you're anywhere in the world, and, and, and exercise your brain. Um, I've watched a lot of people on television with their bookcases behind them in, re in recent weeks. I've got a bookcase behind me. The difference is these are all my books, so, so you, you don't have to turn sideways to, to read them. Today, uh, my neighbour, Sir Richard Pito, who I always name, name I always mispronounce, is one of the world's most distinguished epidemiologists, the man who saved thousands of lives by, with Richard Dahl by, prove, by making the link between smoking and lung cancer. It stopped m millions of us smoking and saved millions and millions of lives. Today, we're going to Talk about Actually, do you know, the, the link between lung cancer and smoking was sorted out when I was seven years old, so it was obviously very precocious if I did it. <laughs> yes, I know, but, but your, your Richard Dolls work uh, in, in the early 60s did, did actually um, firm, yeah. firm up the link. Um, today, uh, uh, the pandemic, the, the, the coronavirus pandemic, Richard's going to talk for a while and then I'm going to ask him some questions, including one or two from you, if you really want to ask a question, email me and I'll make sure it gets to him. Richard, over to you. Okay, well, I've been working with WHO for some years, just as a statistical advisor, working with them on Ebola virus in the Congo. And so they, when they were trying to talk about studies in coronavirus, trying to look at the epidemiology of it, trying to look at what the treatments for it, seemed to thinking what could we do about vaccination or at least testing vaccines for it. They asked me for statistical advice since I've been involved quite a lot with WHO on this. What they're trying to do is to get lots and lots of countries to collaborate, taking drugs, um, old drugs, and trying to repurpose them to see if they're any use against coronavirus. Now, really what we need is new drugs that are really designed to hit coronavirus, but those are gonna take at least a few more months before they can come online. In the meantime, if some existing drugs could make things a bit better for people in hospitals, could give them a better chance of surviving, then it would be well worth knowing about, even if it's only a moderate gain. And so we've taken about half a dozen existing drugs that have already been approved, they've already been used in humans for other things, and trying to find out whether any of them have any material effect on coronavirus. Will you improve your chances of getting out of hospital alive if you take these drugs? We don't expect big effects, but, you know, when you've got something that's really common, when it's, you've got something that's affected two, three million people already, well, actually, the number of infected must be far more than that, then just a moderate improvement could be worth knowing about. At the moment, we've got nothing that we know that works. All hospitals can do at the moment is give you supportive care, try and keep you breathing in the hope that your body can actually get on top of the virus. We've got no way of helping your body to do that. So we're trying to get properly randomised evidence comparing various old drugs in the hope of finding out whether any of them is of any use in improving survival. Meantime, based here at Oxford, there's been a study st started um, about a month ago, but more than a month ago, which has just worked really beautifully, which is asking the same question all over Britain. So rather than collaborate in the WHO trial, the British, because we've got such good structures, have got their own trial going, and it's really randomizing very large numbers. The NHS is ideally suited to this, British medical statistics, the medical records that you've got are ideally suited to it. And so this is really addressing the same questions in parallel. Eventually, the two studies will produce parallel findings, and maybe the findings from both together would be stronger than the findings of either of them would have been on its own. Unfortunately, the main thing we need is better drugs. We need drugs and we need vaccines that work. And at the moment, we don't have either. How, how does this work? Where do you get your sample from? And, and do, you, do you give them other drugs? How, how do you do this? Well, it's I mean, the famous, most famous of these old drugs is chloroquine, because Donald Trump said it was the bee's knees. Actually, it's quite a long shot as to whether chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine can be protective at all. It might be. It does some tricks when you try to, you know, use it to interfere with the virus attacking cultured cells. Could it actually help people? Really, we don't know. 
I mean, if I had to guess, I'd guess no, but is it worth testing? Yes. So you've got chloroquine and then you've got various other drugs, drugs which have been used for treating HIV, the pinavir, for example, interferon. And so these drugs are available. They can be used because they're already licensed. And so you try and get hundreds of hospitals to collaborate and say, look, when somebody comes in, you invite them to let you try at random whether any of these drugs make any difference. And you just do it through huge numbers. I mean, the aim is to randomize many thousands of patients. A few thousand will get one, a few thousand will get another. It's just decided on a toss of a coin who gets what. And so what you do know, if you decide at random like that, is that there were no systematic differences between the people who got such and such a drug and the people who got some other drug or the people who didn't get any of these extra drugs at all. Um, and so, then just the play of chance. Some are going to die, some aren't going to die. If the drugs do nothing, then it'll be the same in both groups. If the drugs are helpful, then okay, the number of deaths might be smaller in one or other of these groups. I'm not holding my breath, but it's certainly worth testing, and this is the way to test it. How big are your samples in Britain and indeed worldwide? Well, this, they're just accumulating now. I mean, there'll, there'll be probably by by the end of next month that there'll be you know 10 20 thousand randomized perhaps i don't know and you know then at that point if there are small benefits from these drugs then they should start showing up and the player chance would stop dominating for the moment the patients entered so recently that it's um it's too soon to have any any serious evidence most of the patients have entered these trials are still in hospital we don't yet know what's going to happen to them is it safe um well, could these drugs do more harm than good? Yes, yes, they could. I mean, in these, I mean, most drugs have got side effects. Hydroxychloroquine, you give too much of it, it's actually dangerous. Um, and, you know, these other ones, these anti-HIV drugs, yes, they can do harm if you use too much of them, so can interferon. But, is, so can you guarantee safety? No. Can you guarantee efficacy? No. How are we going to find out? There really isn't any way other than, you know, trying them out in people to see whether they really make any difference or whether they all make no difference. What's, what's the time scale, Richard, for all of this? When you want a sample... I mean, when one one guess, are we going to get answers within this outbreak? Um, yes, we should have answers by sometime this summer. When this summer, I don't know. Obviously, if there were a big effect, it would show up quickly and... Um, then that would be announced as soon as it's known. But I don't think that expecting a big effect is very realistic. When you talk about moderate effects, then these take longer to show up. It's a bit like aspirin for heart attack. I mean, back I mean, about 30 years ago, people knew that aspirin could was a bit of a blood thinning drug, but then would it make any difference if you gave aspirin in the middle of a heart attack? And we got about 20,000 patients, 10,000 got real aspirin, 10,000 got dummy aspirin. And it turned out that you really could reduce the risk of dying in the middle of a heart attack. Most doctors thought this was just rubbish, that a drug like aspirin could be of no relevance. Others said that it was dangerous. In fact, there was one of the common heart disease drugs that had use of aspirin as supposed to be listed as a contraindication of it. So, you know, just basically getting serious numbers just wipes out opinions that are just not really well founded. Now, you can't prejudge results, but what do you expect? I think the most likely thing is that these aren't, I'm pretty sure these things aren't going to be great, but they could have a moderate effect. They could have a moderate adverse effect. And they, they could have no effect. I think this is really, this is, I, I don't, I think these things are worth testing. I think we ought to be getting serious evidence. The question is serious, therefore the answer should be serious. Um, and if I myself had the disease and got the hospital and, said, and somebody said, would you join such a trial? I'd say yes, because really there isn't any good evidence one way or another at the moment. And you'd want to help in the generation of good evidence. If you joined a trial like that, you might get something that was slightly helpful. You might get something that's slightly harmful. You might get something that makes no difference at all. But uh, in recent days, there's been talk about using blood plasma from oh yes, who... that's more interesting. That that's that could well be, um, that could well turn out to be protective. 
again, we don't know. I mean, you really do need to try these things out to find out whether they do help. I mean, this is the first of the new treatments. This is a new treatment because, of course, you didn't have blood plasma for people who've had the disease. So, yes, this could be um, protective and might have a worthwhile effect. It'd certainly be worth trying. But again, you've got to be very careful that you try it with some people getting it and some people not getting it because if it really makes no difference, then you really don't want to be going through the incredible of trying to get blood out of lots and lots of people who are recovering from the virus and extracting bits from it and infusing them into the patients where you should actually be worried much more about, you know, are you managing to keep them just inside death by getting proper respiration? That's not one of your, the drugs you're testing, I assume? No, not at the moment. What they were doing is testing the ones that were available last month. So when there was a meeting in February, then another meeting in March, the best things they could come up with were these repurposed drugs that can do things when you try to use them in a glass dish, but which might well not do anything in a sort of living person. How closely do you work with your colleagues at the Institute of Vaccinology? who have just got 22.5 million quid from Pat Hancock. Um, well, that's that's a very interesting fact. No, I don't collaborate with them. Oddly, I mean, nearly all my collaborations international. They're in the next building to me. So, um, but, you know, they, they might as well be on another planet. Perhaps if they were a thousand miles away, we'd collaborate more. But the, all of this stuff is very is very international. A lot of this stuff is, is international. When you try to work out what drugs work, then you've got American teams, you've got Chinese teams, you've got um, British teams, you've got teams from involving lots of different countries trying to work together. I mean, we've got in our trial, for example, we've got a lot of Iranians have been randomized. So the Iranian doctor said, look, we don't know whether these things work or not. We'd really like to, we'd really like to find out. So when I had a conference call last week on this, the person on the steering committee from Iran is the vice minister for research, Dr. Reyes. And so it's very nice to be working with an Iranian vice minister, trying to sort out what's in everybody's common interest, which is reliable knowledge. And they've actually, and the Iranian doctors are very glad to be collaborating in things like this. I and mean, it, it, to them, it makes sense. They want knowledge and this is the way to get knowledge. Do you all talk together? Is there a race going on? Is there a competition? There's competition, but very definitely we all talk to each other all the time. I mean, yes, of course, people want to actually get a clear result, but that's um, but there's an overriding thing that we do want to be absolutely honest about what's being done and what the results are. So there's no dishonest competition. There's competition to rush ahead and get things done, but that's actually, if anything, that's helpful. I don't. Th I mean, and and the difference, the the aims aren't really commercial. I mean, some, some, type, some of the drugs that we're looking at are drugs that would be quite expensive, but most of them are old drugs that have been widely used already. And so have no real value for the drug companies or no uh, extreme Well, value. I mean, it'd be valuable to a drug company, even if you're saying something that's generic, to have your things shown to be a protect, to be protective against COVID. But it, yeah, it's, it's, these aren't necessarily big money things. And anyway, if something was a big money thing, then in an emergency like this, international law says that you can violate the patent. So if there was something that really worked, then Indian companies, Brazilian companies can just make it as a generic. They can make good quality drugs. And so nobody's going to be able to just say, right, I've got a patent. Nobody else is allowed to make it in the world because it's a public health emergency. And the, intell and the intellectual property law gets suspended in those circumstances. Now you've worked in the medical field for 50 years probably now. Yeah, Do you expect like there to be a vaccine uh, for coronavirus and, and what sort of time scale? Yes, I think there will be um, vaccines. I think there will be vaccines that work. It may turn out that it's one of these things that it's incredibly difficult to make vaccines to, like um, HIV or malaria. I mean, there's been a huge amount of work on malaria vaccines, HIV vaccines, and nothing really satisfactory has yet emerged. It turns out that these are much more difficult to vaccinate against. The coronavirus is quite big and has got some rather striking targets and it may well be that it's possible to attack those targets and knock it down. It's a thing that a vaccine with reasonable luck ought to be able to control. But again, you don't know until you try. And there's about a hundred different vaccines that are currently in the process of being developed. Some are at a more advanced stage than others. So again, we're going to have to find out actually works. The other thing that WHO is doing is trying to coordinate um, 
trials of vaccines as they emerge. As yet, there is no vaccine that's available ready for trial. But there might well be by, say, the end of, well, sometime in June. And then you need to get, you get at, say, 20,000 people randomised, 10,000 get it, 10,000 don't. Does it make any difference? Obviously, most of those 20,000 people aren't going to be getting the coronavirus anyway. But do you get more cases getting coronavirus in those who don't get the vaccine and those who do? I mean, if that could be done, then that actually, you know, a really good vaccine could be a brilliant solution to the problem that nobody knows how to deal with, which is how on earth can we end this lockdown safely? You know, nobody really knows how to do it. The Chinese did such a brutal lockdown that they really eliminated the virus in China, and now they've just got to stop it creeping back in again from people coming into China. But it's um, but we haven't got a lockdown that's anywhere near as brutal as that. Um, and so we're going to knock it down, but not out with this lockdown. Yeah, bringing it home to Britain, I mean, how long do you expect the lockdown to last and what, when are we going to get the R number down to way below one? Um, I don't know how long it'll last. I don't think I've got any useful comment on that. There have been so many pundits holding forth about that for the past few weeks. I don't think I've got anything to add to it. I mean, you know as much as I do as to what the government says they, they're hoping for, and they don't really know what they're going to say. I and mean, still we're getting several hundred deaths a day, which is, but you know, it's certainly not increasing the way it would have done without the lockdown. I mean, it was doubling every three or four days before the lockdown, and it's stalled and has actually fallen somewhat. So it's it's had quite a big effect on the number of deaths, but nevertheless, what remains is still substantial enough to reignite the epidemic if you just stop and let everything go now. So it's really, it's really not obvious. Um, it's not obvious what to do. But in, in terms of figures, Richard, you know, the, 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 there is doubt as to whether the deaths in hospitals mean anything, but actually... The oh, no, they mean plenty. They mean plenty. They're telling you whether the epidemic is going up, down or sideways. Yes, right. fair number of deaths outside hospital as well. So, I mean, you know, suppose the deaths in hospital add up to 4,000 in some period, and then total deaths might be 6,000. OK, so it's, it's more. But the pattern that is suggested by those hospital deaths is informative as long as you remember there's weekend effects um where the reporting gets delayed. apart from the sort of weekend effects when the reporting gets delayed um the, the the pattern in the hospital deaths is very informative and that's what it offers and that's what the government said consistently then they, they know perfectly well that there are deaths that are not in hospital they're not in these hospitals statistics, but nevertheless are these patterns of deaths in hospital going up down or sideways what, what's this what's the situation in the hospitals this is informative as to how the epidemic is going, the direction in which it's going. And it is easing, but it's still bad. But the FT today crunched the figures and reckoned there were actually 40,000 deaths. 40,000 in this yeah. country. That's pushing it, I think. I think that's... that's. I'd, I'd be interested to know the basis of that claim. I think what the government would have suggested is that it would be about half as many again as has been as have been announced in the hospital numbers. As an also report came out um, today on deaths during the week of the of the fourth to the tenth of April, um, and you know previous to that there was one on the period twenty seventh of March to the third of April, and it was showing it looked as though the the hospital deaths were about two thirds of the total deaths, and that's estimated the total deaths by comparing. The total number of deaths in Britain, regardless of what anybody says about cause, with what you'd expect for this time of year. We'd be expecting about 10,000 deaths a year anyway. That's normally what happens in a week in April. And in the week spanning the um, the end of March or beginning of April, there were 16,000 instead of 10,000. That's an excess of 6,000. Only about 4,000 of them had turned up in the um, in the figures. It was known. It was it, the, the figures aren't there to say is this the actual number. The figures are there because if you look at those daily things and you remember that you get blips from weekend effects, then they, then they can be informative about how the epidemic's developing. And that's what they're for. And they're good for that. So the current figure is about 18,000. So if you say half as much again, that's another nine. So we're talking about 27,000. Yeah. Would yeah, that be a figure you, you might recognise? Yeah, but that, that could well be appropriately, approximately right. And the same is going to be true for pretty well every other country that's reporting deaths as well. The Chinese finally did a big clean-up after the end of the lockdown and Wuhan went back and then, you know, some deaths have been double counted, some deaths haven't been counted at all and so on. And 
their numbers up and everybody said, oh, it's because they were lying. Well, it wasn't at all because they're lying. I mean, you imagine trying to count every single death in the middle of an epidemic like that. And the doctors were working like 10 hour shifts and they had all their bloody nappies because they couldn't get out of their personal protective equipment. They'd be working in, in time to actually use the toilet. They were just so desperate to try and keep people alive, keep them breathing. That's the worst of it. In those circumstances, you're not going to get every death counted. So when they went back and did an accurate count, they've come up with a number which is about 4,000 odd. So I don't know, probably in China, you know, maybe 5,000 deaths. I don't know. They'll, there may still be some that weren't identified, but we're down to something else. But, you know, that's, that's what you're going to get when you try and count how many people exactly die from this, that, the other disease. You've done quite a lot of work in China, haven't you, on, on smoking yeah. and alcohol. Do you trust the Chinese figures? Um, it depends which figures. Um, yes, I think that, um, I th well, yes, I do. Um, I think that they're produced, honestly, there was a three week period at the beginning of January when the Chinese in Wuhan, when it, it were basically trying to cover up the fact that they've got an epidemic. And I expect people, I don't know who in the in Beijing knew about this, but I expect people in Beijing did know about it. And they thought, oh, well, maybe we can cover it up and so on. And then basically they definitely couldn't. So the, the centre came down saying, you know, this is terrible, we're going to lock down Wuhan, you know, we've got to really take strong action, this, the Wuhan government has been very bad, and blaming it all on the Wuhan government, well, I mean, in a centralised state like China, um, you don't do much locally that isn't known about centrally, but anyway, they did come down and really took strong action, and if there was a recurrence, now if they did get another outbreak, they'd again be prepared to take strong action again, um, and I think, yes, I do trust the Chinese figures. And we know we've got fairly regular contact with the people who are compiling those statistics in Beijing. We know what they're doing. We know how they're trying to do it. We know the machinery by which they're trying to do it. And it's, you know, it's machinery that should work. So there's no political direction going on. It. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Is there no political direction going on in terms of the figures? I cannot hear you saying, John. Is, so there, is, there, is there no political direction? There's no, no interference from the centre? I don't know. I think that there probably is some sort of interference, but I think that I think that at the moment, I think they're trying to describe stuff as it is, apart from the others describing it as it is, um, is considerably to the credit of the Chinese system. And the, the fact that they've actually managed to stamp this out is going to be used as an argument for totalitarianism for the next few decades. Okay, let's go back to basics. What's an epidemiologist? What 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 do they do? There's an old man broken down by age and sex. Um, well, we, we try to look at patterns of disease. We want to know, you know, which death rates are going up, which death rates are going down, are lung cancer rates in Britain going up or down. We want to know why those things are happening. Sometimes we're looking at smaller problems, small problems. Sometimes we're looking at big problems. Um, you'd want to try to understand what I want to do is try and understand the really large patterns of of mortality in the world when everybody's going to die death in old age is inevitable but death before old age isn't most deaths before old age have got an avoidable cause and we want to understand those causes and what can be done about the big causes so I mean obviously in this country one of the biggest causes is still tobacco I mean temporarily coronavirus has caused, when you say it's caused 30,000 deaths, yeah, well, tobacco is causing about 100,000 deaths every year. So we've had about three months of tobacco deaths so far. And I'm not saying that the coronavirus deaths don't matter, but I think somehow the tobacco deaths are so normal that we've forgotten that that's happening every day. I mean, every, every week in the world, there are about 100,000 tobacco deaths. So it, worldwide, coronavirus has caused about two weeks of tobacco deaths. And that's an example. And it's it's not saying that things that aren't tobacco don't matter, but it is saying that, you know, if something's causing 10 times as many deaths as something else, then it's 10 times as important. And other epidemiologists are doing all sorts of other things. You've got to have epidemiological monitoring to know when you get an out, a new outbreak of something like Ebola, and then you've got to just jump in and stamp it out really firmly. I mean, as this coronavirus epidemic was beginning, the WHO had been struggling in extraordinarily difficult circumstances in Eastern Congo for about 18 months to wipe out an Ebola epidemic, which was in the middle of a conflict zone. I remember when I was giving a lecture in WHO once on what the, what the results were, this is last December, 
the director general was sort of sitting next to me, he stood up and said, well, you know, before Professor Pito starts talking, I'd like us to stand for a minute in memory of the four field workers who were murdered yesterday. You know, you just, and they've just been grabbed by some marauding gang there and shot in the head. And it's under those circumstances that it actually did control the epidemic. And, you know, they were still dealing with that when, as the coronavirus thing broke out, and you know, then now there's a few more new cases of Ebola, and unless somebody recognises that and goes in and stamps on it, that could be another really serious outbreak. I mean, Ebola is serious if you don't jump on it fast. And so, got, so this is this is epidemiology. Epidemiology is just studying the patterns of disease. It can be rare diseases or common diseases. It can be very explosive outbreaks, or it can be very very slow epidemics like tobacco. I mean, tobacco basically cigarette smoking started to go up in the 1890s, reached its maximum in the 1970s, and is now on the way down and is still causing 100,000 deaths a year in this country. So that you can have all kinds of timescales for, for various things, and the, the aim is to understand these patterns. It can be other things, it doesn't have to be death, but um, we still have about 30 million deaths a year before age 70, and you know, it'd be nice if it could uh, be diminished. Now, words we keep hearing, what is a model? How do you do develop a model? And what what does it tell you? Well, very simply, if you if you say that everybody who gets infected, if on average you're going to infect two other people, and you've got an epidemic that's growing, whereas if you can get it down so that on average you infect only half another half of another person, in other words, most people don't infect anybody else, and some some infect one or two people, then and you've got an epidemic that's dying out. And if you can get behaviour change like a lockdown, then this, what they call R or R0, which is the reproduction rate, go down so that each new case will reduce fewer than one, le less than one new case on average. And that's the circumstances needed for epidemics to die down. That could be helped by vaccination if we had a vaccine, which for coronavirus we don't. And it can be helped by behavioural change. I mean, if really we all stayed locked down like in Wuhan, it would go down and out. I mean, the Chinese, by getting everybody with this really brutal lockdown, um, kept, they got the reproduction rate well below one, and the virus just completely died out in Wuhan. What about by testing? Should we test the population? Because we don't really know how many have coronavirus. Yes, this is, this is, um, there's two kinds of tests. There's one to say whether you are currently infected, you know, whether you've actually got something. That's the one where you put a swab in your throat and send it off to get a RNA test, what they call a reverse transcriptase test. Um, and another one, which isn't as well developed, which is sort of coming along, is where you get a blood sample or maybe even a spot of blood and see whether you've got antibodies to the virus, which would be evidence that you have been infected. So one is saying, are you infected? And the other is saying, have you ever been infected? And the one saying, are you infected, is better developed. Well, it's, 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 it's easier to use. And you know, when you get positive results, they're real. And the one that says, have you ever been infected? I think still there's some work being done on this, although it's, it's sort of getting more and more satisfactory all the time. It is now being used. Um, and if you knew who was currently infected and could quarantine them, then it would be much easier to prevent them infecting other people. And the problem with this, with this virus, it's like HIV. HIV was that you were infectious while you were still completely normal, when you were still apparently completely normal. So you were infectious for a long time while you appeared totally healthy. And with this disease, the problem is that you get infected, you become infectious, dangerous to other people, before you finish up noticing that you're ill. Those are the ones that are really difficult to stop. So the test means that you could pick people up at an earlier stage. And so my brother, who is also an epidemiologist, um, is, has argued that although it sounds insanely expensive, so is a lockdown. And the best way to get out of a lockdown is instead of being able to do about 30,000 tests a day, which is the current limit, or about 100,000 tests a day, which is what the government wants to get the, um, the limit to, we should be aiming at um, 10 million tests a day, which is 100 times more than 100,000 tests a day. And that if you were testing people every week, then you could pick out who's infected in time to really stop them infecting anybody else except their own families. 
and if you get those infected and get them into a sort of family lockdown, okay, the whole family will get infected, but it won't pass outside there. So again, it's, it just gets the um, reproduction rate for each infection down, down to the point where you know, most people who get infected don't infect anybody else outside their immediate family. So the argument that, that can one actually do testing on anything like that scale, I mean, it's never been done before, but can it be done? He no, argues, there are 23 uh, testing stations, which are way underused at the moment, the, dri the driving testing station. Yeah, yeah. Do you support his position? Do you think there should be mass testing? At the, at the moment, what his position is, is that this could well be the best way out of the, out of the problem. And he's arguing that we should be um, doing this on a pilot basis in some big town or other, say somewhere with a population of two, three hundred thousand, I don't know, Southampton, Aberdeen, some, anyway, somewhere or other, just do it in one big town and find out what the practical problems are. Can you get people in to test in, in big enough numbers? Can you actually get the quarantine to stick afterwards if somebody's positive um, until their family is either, you know, until they're all sort of either they've had it and got better or didn't get it in the first place? So the, he, he's arguing that this should be piloted, that the that it, the, the lockdown is so catastrophic, it's having such a catastrophic effect on society that this is itself going to produce, you know, really, you know, almost worse effects on mortality than the, than the virus itself would, that the economic damage is going to be so great and that um, in comparison with keeping people off work completely, getting them to do one test a week is actually quite a small fraction of that. It's furloughing costs forty billion pounds over three three months. So I mean that's I'm sorry? furloughing costs the government about forty billion over three months. So that's quite a small cost. I mean, would be mass yes. testing sure. Yeah, that's right. That's what he's arguing anyway. And I, I think to argue that this should be piloted, I think really makes um, it makes reasonable sense to learn the practical problems. Other people want to try to use testing, you know, a bit more selectively, directly testing where you've got more reason to suspect you're going to find something. Obviously, starting off with healthcare, healthcare workers. I mean, my son is a doctor who works up at John Radcliffe, and a few weeks ago, you know, he, and he works in infectious disease, so obviously he's absolutely on the front line. And so, a few weeks ago, he got coronavirus, and you know, before he knew where he was, his wife was infected, and his kids were infected, and they've all got better now when he's back at work. But some, um, you know, some, um, it's it's a it's a mean virus. Have the Germans got something to teach us on all of that? What on testing? Testing. Yeah, they they did they did a lot more testing than most other nations, and they do seem to have limited the damage, perhaps as a result of that. I haven't really studied the German situation very much. The numbers, the, um, the death numbers, really are quite encouraging. Nothing like Spain or Italy or Britain or France. So, if you were to give one piece of advice to Matt Hancock, what would it be? Apart from uh, take the knives out your back, Matt, which is uh, political. Well, I'm sure he's got so much advice. The last thing he wants is more advice. But I'd say, look, every 10,000 deaths really matters. Tobacco is 100,000 deaths a year. When we get over this one, don't forget tobacco, because this is the one which is over, overwhelmingly a political disease. You know, why, why should we have 300,000 deaths a year in the European Union, 300,000 deaths a year before age 70 in the European Union from tobacco. And it's, it's a political decision as to whether this happens or not. As you go across the bridge from Denmark to Sweden, there's nearly a tenfold decrease in the number of tobacco deaths. It is, it's a political disease. So I, I think that, remember, there are other things as well. I mean, obviously, he's going to be so swamped with this and thinking about nothing but this. A couple you know, of questions that come in from, from real people outside. This is from Hugh Lee, who you may know. Uh, you say that at the moment, there's nothing can help the patient fight the virus. Oxygen and ventilation, anything else? Well, I said that we've got no drugs that help, but what you can do is give supportive care to get them, to sort of keep them breathing while their body takes over. And that's what the oxygen is doing. That's what the oxygen is doing. That's what the mechanical ventilation does. That saves lives people who would just die from suffocation within the next half hour, instead get one of these ventilators shoved in them and 
you know, they're unconscious because they're, they're drugged solidly. I mean, you couldn't actually be fighting against it if you were conscious. They're, they're rendered unconscious and just they put on mechanical breathing in the hope that their body can beat the virus and get things under control again. Then they can be weaned off the ventilator. And sometimes it works. And, you know, sometimes lesser interventions will work. But it's the basic aim is just to keep people breathing, just to give supportive care in the hope that their body's going to take over. But there's a New York doctor who argues that actually ventilators don't work because coronavirus builds a yellow phlegm inside the lungs, which stops the oxygen going through. Yeah, you'd just be dead within half an hour if you don't get ventilated when you're really, when you're really on the edge of dying. And when, when the person is just dying from respiratory failure in front of you, you, you may wonder, worry about what's going to happen a few days down the line. But, you, you know, if, they, if you die now, dying now doesn't do too, too much for your prognosis a few days down the line. You can see people who are just on the edge of death and you can rescue them from that. And a lot of people do get back off the ventilator and back on the same. The ventilator doesn't work. It's just silly. But I don't care whether the doctor's a person is a doctor or not. It's just a silly comment. And it's, do CPAPs work better than ventilators? Um, well, it's a weaker form of support. I mean, you're, if, if CPAP, look, CPAP is jargon. So it just means basically you're trying to just push your got positive pressure just continuous positive pressure trying to get oxygenated air into the lungs you know just so it, it that can suffice but you can quite rapidly progress to the point where that is not self-sufficient to keep you breathing and then you can go on to other forms of um support one being what they call bpap which is you know bi-directional positive air pressure which is essentially pushing and then reducing the pressure, pushing and then reducing the pressure, which is just a bit more supportive. And then the further one is the mechanical ventilation, putting people on a ventilator, which, you know, as again, you anesthetize and get unconscious in order to do it. But it depends, it depends how bad the problem is, what you need to try, and you may need to progress from one to another. Question from Dr. Innes Matthew. They're just different stages of, of support of the process. Dr. Innes Smythe, who I don't think is not a medical doctor, about why are more men dying than women? And as a subsidiary, why are more people of brown and black skin dying than people with white skin? I'd like to see the statistics first off. Um, on the, the male is very definite. I mean, it's clear from China, it's clear from a lot of places that it, there's a higher death rates in men. Um, there was an interesting paper recently pointing out that um, people who've got chronic, some sort of chronic obstructive lung disease already are about four times as great a risk of dying, and that smokers seem to be at substantially greater risk of dying. It's basically, you're dying from lung failure, and the main thing that damages lungs in the modern world is tobacco. So I think some of the sex difference is going to be tobacco. Um, whether that's all of it, I don't know. Um, you need to know what not... the infection rates are, too. I mean, when you say... I mean, the claim is that, you know, the black people are at higher risk. Well, it, it depends really on the circumstance in which they live. I mean, if a black person finished up living in an isolated farm, they'd be at zero risk. But the question, you, you've got to ask how much exposure do people get? And I don't think that, I don't think there's reliable evidence on this. If you took nurses of various colours, then that might be a more reasonable comparison. But I think it's actually going to be quite a difficult research question to sort out. And what, it's one of these things, too, where people always feel certain of the answer before the evidence comes in. Now, really a social question. A large number of the National Health Service deaths, particularly among doctors, have been British Asians. Do you think that will lead to much more tolerance uh, of, the, of the British? It depends how social media are used deliberately to manipulate intolerance. Rationality, human sympathy and real news are much less powerful than the social media manipulations that we just saw the first glimpse of in 2016 and they delivered Donald Trump and Brexit. These things, uh, these things as machines of breeding intolerance are just so bad. I don't, know what, I don't know what the world should do about them. I mean, the, the, the Rohingya expulsions and so on. I mean, yes, I mean, there was, you know, there, there was Islamic activity there, but on a fairly low scale. But the, you know, getting 
popular feeling whipped up against the Rohingyas was Burmese military use of Facebook. I mean, you can, I, I think if things like that are, I think these are much bigger determinants of intolerance. And as far as I can see, it's much easier to stimulate intolerance than just to stimulate tolerance, I think. So should we clap for Brown, for, for, for Brown NHS tomorrow night? Clap, clap for, for British Asian doctors and nurses. Oh, that's what they're clapping for. I just clap for nurses and doctors. Is it supposed to be clapping for brown and black ones now? Just everybody. That's it's. Come on. Okay, I, okay that's a life doing international health. I've been, I've, you know, I work on. I mean, if, if I'm a statistician, the first statistic of the world is that 99% of the world is not British. And so, you know, if you're going to be interested in primitive death, you've got to be interested in the 99% that's not British, at least as much as the 1% that is British. I, 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 don't, I don't like this, um, too much identification with one group or another group in this context or any other. Okay, now, epidemiologists, you all agree with each other. I mean, there's a pretty vicious story in today's private eye about the Imperial College team and their past records. Um, I haven't read private eye today. Um, this is what, looking at some... Um, the BSC outbreak. Yes, it is. It, it is. And, 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 Imagine, yeah. And, I mean, it's the one that most people attack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's not clear that they were wrong. You know, we know what happens. We don't know what happens in various other in various other scenarios. But it's, it's again, it's very easy to get indignant. And um, who do we trust? So the government said they're led by science, science and medicine. What does that mean? Well, there was this attitude we've had enough of experts, um, which actually wasn't exactly what Gove said, but it, um, it's, what, it's what he's famed for saying. But they've, they've very much tried, I mean, at various levels of government, they've actually tried to, to get scientific evidence. And I think it, it, it wasn't quick enough. The decision to take this seriously wasn't taken quickly enough within government. It should have been taken more quickly. They did have expert committees advising them, and the expert committees really managed to change the middle of government in about mid-March. And it would have been better if things had changed earlier. But they they have you know, there is no choice. I mean, you have to actually try and try and get the best the best evidence as to what is happening. And this really does is and you're going to get people who are experts disagreeing. You've got to listen to that, to that disagreement as well. And you know, maybe the conclusion is that there, there are a range of opinions that are actually compatible with what is known. And that, that is, scientists could be wrong. Well, of course scientists are going to be wrong. The question is not whether scientists can be wrong. I mean, very often there's, there's heterogeneity of reasonable, unreasonable estimates about something. So, that, I mean, when, when there was a lot of um, talk about climate change about 15, 20 years ago, there was an inter international intergovernmental um, panel on climate change. They gave a range of scenarios. And actually, it seems that what's happening is that the upper end of their range of what might happen, you know, they were criticized for being alarmist, but actually it does look as though what's happening is within the range of things they said possible, but it seems to be it's towards the upper end of that range rather than the lower end. But you know, there's, there's going to be on lots of things, there's going to be various different futures possible and you can't decide reliably between them and you try to get what evidence you can but to, to, to say somebody's a scientist and then scientists can be wrong of course i mean everybody knows that the, the rules are you, know, you try you try things out and you you get discussion as to what's the evidence for or against such and such a thing when some scientists are really keen on the idea that chloroquine might be helpful other, other people think it's going to do more harm than good because it can be poisonous it's, you know, you need, you need evidence. Yes, I mean, the herd immunity was floated for a while and then disappeared again, I think helped by Dominic Cummings in that, in that case. Was, is that like- That doesn't prove true? it's not true. Hmm? What's that, Richard? That doesn't prove it's not true. <laughs> no, Dominic, because Dominic Cummings believes it. I think the thing is people hadn't, he, people hadn't really been explicit as to how many deaths this would involve. I mean, if, if you just leave people living as they were without any kinds of precautions, then the virus is going to spread through a large fraction of the population. I mean, the, you know, a, a good majority of the population would be infected before you finish up with enough people having had the disease and therefore unable to catch it again and pass it on. 
And so when you do the arithmetic, then herd immunity says, okay, let's have a few hundred thousand deaths. And then the survivors will have enough of them having been infected that the virus won't be able to spread anymore. And so the, the infection will die out. But I think they hadn't really thought through that this did mean a few hundred thousand real deaths. It may be that you just can't stop it. And that is going to be what's happened, what happens. But at the moment, what we're trying to do is to avoid really letting it rip and do the whole population. And we'll see what's possible. And of course, the situation could be transformed if we got a widely practical vaccine once it had been shown to work. Now, you don't know, and I don't know, what percentage of the population do you think have had coronavirus uh, properly in this country? Oh, I don't know. It's... Um, what do you think the estimated numbers are? I mean, it's, it, 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 the real numbers must be um, considerably better than the, considerably bigger than the, um, let's see, something. Um, so I'm just looking, here we are, just updated for Britain. So the number that's known for Britain is 133,000. So the real number must be a few hundred thousand. Well, if it was half a million, if it was, if it was 600,000, that would be 1% of the population. So we've got no herd immunity at all. We're 99% naive, as is the Chinese population. You know, the large majority in China haven't had it, and yet they stopped the disease. And if we've had 600,000 infected, I don't know if that's, num if that's the real number, then that's one percent so 99 percent of us are still available for the disease to jump into and pass on from so I, th I think herd immunity is you know it's all very well to say it. i think they didn't think through what it meant and when they did think through what it meant and really got, got serious about it then they quickly stopped talking about it now um you you work a lot with who and they've come under a lot of flack particularly from one donald J J trump the well-known uh, American intellectual and president. Um, how well have they done in this in this pandemic? Well, I'm biased because I'm so close to them, so I'll declare a bias to start with. Um, I think that they've done very well. I think they've actually done very well. Um, I think there was a particular occasion on the 22nd of January, where a committee, I mean, Tedros was trying to push a committee to say, to declare this as a public health emergency of international concern. And according to the WHO rules, it didn't meet those criteria. That committee had Americans on it, had Brits on it, it had people from many different countries on it. And he wanted to make this announcement, but he is constrained by what these committees decide. You know, it's not a presidential system where the president can say what he likes. It's a system where you know, you, certain of these things, there are definite procedures for deciding what you can say and what you can't say. And this committee, despite Tedros pressing it, didn't at that meeting declare it as such and didn't actually come to it until a week later when they did declare it as such. Um, you know, because at the time of the first meeting, quite correctly, it didn't satisfy the particular rules that have been laid down for this. So I think that, you know, there are, things, there are particular things like that that could be criticized. I think overall, I think that they were pushing from a very early stage to get this taken seriously. I mean, Tedros flew down to China, you know, not long after it was first announced, you know, while the Chinese in Wuhan were still denying it and came back, you know, saying that this is really serious. And I was trying to persuade other people that it was as well. Um, it's, you know, you, you jump too soon and you get accused of jumping too soon. And you get this sort of swine flu phenomenon where people laugh at you because you said swine flu was going to be a big, big deal. And then you delay a week or so too, and you get criticized for that. I mean, Trump obviously has just decided that this is a good way of, um, you know, diverting attention from, from his own um, activities. And, and he's right, he'll, you know, Fox News is covering it and they'll, they'll, and they'll, they'll do Trump's, Trump's version of it and that's what it's for. Um, but, you know, could any organization do better? Yes, yes, I've got, but did they do pretty well? Yes. and. You know, I think in in places like the Congo, which is now seems like a much more localized problem, the way they actually dealt with the Ebola outbreak in Eastern Congo in the middle of a conflict zone, I thought, you know, again, it got criticized, but I thought they actually did 
really very well. I mean, you could argue that, you know, it could have started, you know, more, more energetically at an early stage, but you're going into the middle of a conflict zone. You don't have local workers you can use. You, they've got to bring in pe people from Guinea who've got some experience of this. Um, so I, I think that in lots of ways, I think they've done well. And I think Bruce Aylward's report on the situation in China from the WHO mission there was, I thought, remarkably well judged. Now, I hate to be Donald Trump's brief, but he says they're China's stooges. That's why he's taking whatever it is, $400 million away from them. No, nah, it's not that. It's, he, look, he wants to be able to say something like that just for Fox News purposes. His concern is only how it's going to get, how it's going to play in America. Um, and there's, you know, WHO really persuaded Chinese to, you know, to actually take it more seriously. Well, maybe. I think, I think this is just, a, it's just, you know, it's a silly thing to say. I mean, you know, Donald Trump previously said that there's that, you know, measles vaccination is causing autism. I mean, Donald Trump is not an authority on what vaccines do. Suddenly he wants to know things about, he wants vaccines, wants everything done by vaccinations. Well, jolly good. But it's, it's, you know, I mean, his reality is reality TV. You know, the reality now, let's look for light at the end of the tunnel as we come towards the end. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? And, you know, when might it be in Britain and indeed in the rest of the world? Well, I think we're going to have to, I mean, unless it really rips, which I think in some parts of the world it's going to, um, we're going to have to try to limit the extent to which we infect each other. We put each other at risk of infection. And, I, and really that's going to continue to be true unless a vaccine emerges. And, you know, who knows? I mean, it's reasonable to hope that we'll have a vaccine of demonstrated value by the end of this year. It's reasonable to hope. But it may not be. It may well not be. I mean, that's if things go really well. And then, how, what are we going to do? We could manufacture a billion doses. Yes, we can. But again, how long is this going to take? But, you know, every, every day, something like 100 million children get vaccinated, actually due very much to the WHO's influence, the extended program immunization. It's about, so sorry, let me get, go back on this. That's, that's, that's an exaggeration. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my days, my months, my things mixed up. We've got several million doses of vaccine get administered to children every year. And several, you know, that's several hundred million every year and several hundred million doses of flu vaccine. And so, you know, we, we, we could vaccinate large numbers. If we have a vaccine that works, we can really get it to work and really ramp up production and really get it around. And unless we can do that and we don't get sort of anti-vaccine people like the sort of anti-polio vaccine or anti-measles vaccine, but unless unless we can actually do that, then I think we things aren't going to be the same again. And also the economic damage is going to remain. I mean, this is probably the biggest slump of the of, from more than a hundred years it's going to cause. And I don't know what that is going to do to society. I don't know what kind of intolerance this is going to produce and what kind of hardship. I mean the you know and it could feed on into causing I mean, you can sit, look at some serious scenarios that could feed into producing serious famine in various places. And who knows what this is going to do in areas like Idlib or in refugee camps. So I don't know what on earth the situation is there. And it seems that the only hope really for getting this thing you know, under control is to get a vaccine. And even then we're going to come out into a world that's been really very seriously damaged by it. Uh, last question from a member of the public who wants to know, do you agree with Tricia Greenhall that if we all wear masks in public, we'll reduce RO to a sufficient extent to beat the illness? Um, I don't know what the effect of working, wearing masks in public would be, nor is Trish. Um, it's maybe a bit fanciful. I think it probably isn't going to be as easy as that. And people tried doing these things, and you know, the I mean, the, you know, my son 
who Trish Greenhouse knows very well, was um, was a doctor taking all possible precautions. I mean, he was a serious infectious disease doctor. He's been working in infectious disease for a long time. He was serious about precautions. He got infected, so did various other doctors. I mean, the virus is very, very infectious. And, you know, it's, um, if you're old, then that infection is dangerous. I mean, it kills some young people, but it kills quite a lot of old people. This is the last CV question. Is this the greatest public health uh, crisis the world has faced, certainly in the 20th and 21st centuries? Um, no, probably not. Um, although the economic effect is pretty spectacular. So I mean, if it's, the economic effects may be a lot bigger than other ones, but the probably, the, I mean, who knows how this is going to evolve. But the 1919 flu epidemic, I mean, people used to estimate that it caused about 50 million deaths, but it looks like 20 million deaths, and it looks like it caused that huge, something like 50 to 100 million deaths. Um, so that was that was 1919. And the, and I'll, I'll give again another example. The epidemic of tobacco deaths in the 20th century caused 100 million deaths, and, and the present smoking levels, if they continue, if we keep the current smoking rates, then we're going to have about a billion tobacco deaths this century. So at the moment, no, but is it a disaster? Yes. How are we going to get out of it? Well, I don't know, but not immediately. Uh, we still don't have to... any drugs that work and we don't have any vaccines that work. Moving on to Jericho. Now you've lived here for 30 plus years, 40 plus years? Yeah, 40 plus. 40 plus. What is it you like about Jericho? <laughs> well, it's more than half my life. It's um, it's where my kids grew up. It's um, you know, I had to know all the corners of it and spend all my life wandering around other countries. I used to be in a different city every week, and it's um, it's quite nice to have some roots that you come back to. So it's um, it's it suits me. Um, you know, I don't want particularly to be rich, but it's quite nice to walk down the road and meet people you know. Is it is it the social mix do you like? Is it the community? What is it? Nah, it's just that I've lived here for so long. You finish up you finish up loving what you know really, unless it's really bad. I mean people can have nostalgia for the slums where they grew up as well. But I I, I like I, I don't want to be too sentimental about it. I don't, it it's it, it's okay. I'm I'm lucky to have lived here. I'm lucky to have had good kids, I'm lucky with the local schools. Um, and you know, so yeah, it's 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 all right. It's just some people. Get and you survived cancer, Richard. Yeah, that will suit me very well. Yeah, and you survived cancer as well. <laughs> I survived cancer too. Yeah, uh, that didn't oh. was going to happen, but it did. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Well, just before we go, I'm just going to do a plug uh, for Canfield for next week's event, which is another Jericho professor, Professor Jim Naismith from from Harwell who is a biochemist and he's the go-to person for um for for the daily mail at the moment on cv uh, next wednesday at five the week after that tim boswell the manager of bbc oxford on the 6th of may on the 13th of may um local resident dr innes smith on travel with oxfam and then on the 20th of may a, another virtual town hall which will be called imagine jericho but thank you all for watching and see you next uh, wednesday Thanks to everybody.